any conversations. Know that talk for the nation. You've got to grind and be patient. Ain't no time to be complacent. Get the people ready to wait. Haters are going to keep on hating. But the show is going wrong. Know the world's yours to take. Block, 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 block. What's happening? What up, though? We got Kim Chase in the house immediately. Okay, listen, check this out. Welcome to the show, Candid Conversations. Tonight, I have a very special guest tonight. Uh, I've been knowing this young man <laughs> for uh, nearly 20 years, and uh, he's, he's, he's touched on a lot of... Uh, a lot of hits in the game that you know, that you've heard, that you've seen in, in your showers, in your cars. He's a uh, he's he's affiliated with a lot of Smash Records, and um, he's done a lot of great things in the music industry for a lot of great people. And I'm happy to have him on. Um, my guest tonight is uh, my good friend, Mark Stewart. Let me get him on here. Mark. What's up? <laughs> What's up, Ali? What's going on, man? What's going on, big dog? You got it, man. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Nah, man. I'm happy you asked me to be on. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm a little camera shy. I don't usually do a lot of talking, but um, for you, for you, I did. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, hey, I, I'm, I'm camera shy, too. I'm, I'm, my wife is forcing me to... No, I ain't going to say that. She's <laughs> <laughs> you need to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, though. I feel you. Uh, it's just, this this is new to me, man, but I, I'm kind of liking it. But um, I really appreciate you getting on the show and doing this for me, man. But uh, uh, no, you listen, know what? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I'm glad to have you here, man. And, and you know, we go way back. And um, I know when I when I originally called you and asked you, uh, it, there was no hesitation. So I was like, I got to get my brother on the show, man. You know, you uh, well, you from Michigan, man. Home. You know, you you from Detroit. You know, I'm from from Illinois. So you know, us Midwesterners, we got to stick together. You know, got to stick together. We got to, yeah. man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So um, I want to jump right into this, man. First of all, uh, you just said you were from Illinois, but just just so my viewing audience understands and knows exactly where you're from, you're from Chicago. So from, we're from the suburbs of Chicago. It's funny now because you know, growing up, we say we're from Chicago, we're from Chicago, but now it's like everybody want to know what, what what street, what block you from. I, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in a, <laughs> a, a town called Cal, Calumet City, Illinois. It's about it's about 20 minutes outside the city. Okay, so let me ask you this: What was it like? Um, because you know, I, I know a couple of people before you and I met. I was back and forth to Chicago doing a lot of work, and I, I know a couple of people from Chi Town. But what was it like for you growing up in Chicago, man? What was your life like coming up? Um, well, the, the interesting thing about Chicago for us, for my particular family, is that uh, we were heavy in the jingle industry. Um, that's what sort okay. of permitted us to um, be in in the studio. And, and when I say us, I mean. Both my brothers are record producers. Uh, my brother, Layton mm -hmm. Stewart, who got us our start in the industry, put me on at the tender age of 19. Um, and my younger right. brother, Tricky Stewart, who started when he was 15. So we all started. Um, and then our parents, my mom was a, a, a jingle singer and a background singer, along with uh, her sister, Kitty Haywood, who was the, uh, who's the mother of Jason Weaver, who's my cousin. And then right. okay. Kook. My cousin Kook, who's a uh, established vocal producer, who uh -huh. vocal produces for Rihanna and everybody else. His mom, uh, my aunt Vivian, may she rest in peace. Was they used to sing together along with my cousin Cynthia Kook's sister. So we used to tag along to sessions with them okay. uh, growing up, and uh, whether they were singing jingles or singing records, backgrounds for Aretha Franklin or even in their own deals. Uh -huh. uh, my mom and them had a deal with uh, Mercury. Mercury Records back in the, I guess the mid seventies, and then uh, deal with Capital in the early eighties. So we was always kind of in and around the studio. It was sort of something music was always around, instruments were always around, and and uh, you know my brothers were blessed with all of this talent, and I got none of it. So I had I had to learn how to do business. <laughs> I didn't know how to play anything. <laughs> right. But 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 you got but you got the smarts though. So that's that's a hey, that's just as good. Say hey, man. I think you froze up a little bit. Let's see. Hold on. Right. There you go, there you go, there you go. You, I got you back. Yeah. You froze up for a minute. Yeah, yeah, I got you back. Okay. You did? So um you... I'm sorry, man. Yeah, okay. but um, but you got the smarts, so you got you got you got the brains, man. So, you know, the brains without the brains behind the, the talent, there's you know, you know, you can't go that far. <laughs> you know? Well well my, my grandmother my grandmother made me uh made me like learn the business so I could look out for my family. So that ended up being my, my role. Uh -huh. 
um, to everybody is to kind of do business and and, and learn the business. Um, so there you go. I got you back. I got you back. You was freezing for a minute. There you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me good? Yeah, it's coming. It's just, it seems like it's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a little freeze on my. I got you now. Okay, we're good. Let me, okay. let me go ahead before it freezes. Okay, again. I think we're good. Um, <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Now let me ask you this. Um, so, so uh, you you do management, and um, because when I first met you, you or I met you as management. You know, that's that's what I knew you as um, many many yeah. moons ago. But let me ask you this: How did how did that come about? Like exactly how? Well, let, let me just put it like this: How did you break off into doing management? Was it just like, because um, I know you just mentioned earlier, you said your brother's got all the talent. So was it just like a choice, like, well, they got the talent, so this is something that I'm forced to do? Or was it was there a love for it there? Was it something that you sought out to do? No, not at the beginning. Um, at the beginning, I was a, I was a gopher. Um, my brother Lenny <laughs> hired me to go get coffee for his jingle clients and okay. uh, pick, up, pick up food and stuff like that. You know, that's kind of how I started, which is like, there's nothing unique about that. That's how everybody starts in it. Uh, that yeah, starts yeah. on this side of the business. You start as a runner and things of that nature. Yeah. And then I actually thought I was going to be an engineer. I actually spent some time engineering uh, in the early, early days and cutting vocals okay. and, you know, recording. And back in those days, we had the two-inch tapes and, you know, all that type yeah. of stuff. So it was like, yeah. but then I realized, like, engineering has a lot to do with frequencies and megahertz. And it started feeling like science class. So I'm like, I'm cool on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right. but really what I was doing was just kind of trying to help solve some problems okay. for my brothers and learn at the same time. I would, you know, look over contracts, um, that, that Laney was getting early in his career and uh -huh. not look, when I say looking them over, like not knowing what the hell I was looking at, but looking them over and being able to sort of pose questions, um, okay. so I would call his lawyer and go, Hey, you know, what does this mean? And what does that mean? And I had a lot of lawyers got him going way back because it's 30 years ago but um a lot of lawyers that for me and my wife because my wife who we've been together 31 years we've okay. been managing together all this time okay. so okay. you know whether it was doug mark who taught us a lot or bonnie berry who was our lawyer uh -huh. for a long time who taught me a lot that's sort of where i got sort of the skills of managing particularly from the legal side um okay. the idea of managing came from uh uh, uh, one of my guys that I consider one of my mentors, a guy by the name of Herb Trowick, he was a manager. I met him when, um, this is guy Lee, this is like maybe 1990, 91. Uh, okay. He had a client, his client, Brian McKnight at the time. Yeah. They flew him down to Chicago, flew him out to Chicago to work with my brother Laney. And they ended up working on some stuff. Nothing ended up coming out of those sessions, but I ended up establishing a relationship with Herb. And her, okay. who was a manager and managed him, was like, hey, he, he kind of mentioned it. He's like, you know, he said, your clients, whatever. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, don't, mm -hmm. you, manage your, don't you manage your brothers? So I was like, I didn't even know producers could, at that time, I didn't even know producers could have managers. You right, know? So right. He, like, Herb was the one who sort of put the idea in my head that okay. you're managing them. Like, wow. And so, and then that, so then that was like, okay, cool. Then I mean, that should be getting a commission. And, you know, that right. sort of one thing led to another. And then, right. you know, we started to really roll with it. But, like, prior to that, I was just helping out, and they were just chipping me off money where they could, you know. Got you. Got you. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great. I never knew that, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, but, but now, let me ask you this. So, have you, have you ever branched off outside of your brothers and did any managing for? And I'm saying, I'm saying, like, in the beginning. I know you do it now, but I'm saying, like, in the beginning mm -hmm. stages, um, were, you just do, were you just dealing with your brothers only? Or were you, like, kind of, like, you know, spreading yourself around a little bit? Well... <sighs> That's a good question. The answer to that is yes. But I'll say it like this. I A lot of the things that I manage, if I'm being fair and honest about it, a lot of the things I manage were things that sort of naturally kind of came into us and that we were as a collective okay. working with. I managed Sam Salter through his first album. Sam Salter, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, he was an artist that was signed to us that I managed his career. I managed Blue Cantrell through her first album. I uh -huh. managed Frank Ocean for a very short period of time. Uh -huh. Even when I was super really young, um, I called myself managing and, and I wasn't really doing shit, but you know, walking around, calling myself a manager. I didn't know what it meant to break an artist, but I was even working with Robin Thicke for a very short period of time when we all uh, met. That's Because when I first moved to L.A., those were the guys that I met. I met okay. uh, my guy, Tab, 
who you know Tab is, is an executive is in uh, out in L.A. He was in a yeah. group with Sam Salter and, and, and Robin Thicke and this other kid, and they had a little biracial group that they they were dope because because Rob could sing, Robin Thicke could sing, and okay, then yes. Sam could sing, and Sam could sing, and then we came to from Chicago and we had a little little biracial group. It was tricky. <laughs> my brother, my cousin Sean, and then these two white guys, uh -huh. and. Now, the cool thing was our group could really write songs and produce uh -huh. because they were young producers, but they couldn't sing and they weren't really stars. Uh -huh. That group had some stars in it, but they didn't have any good songs. So the way we ended up coming together, it was uh, Lul, Lul Silas, who was also one of my mentors. Okay. Uh, Lul um, had somebody that he worked with named Madeline Randolph. And Madeline right. took a meeting. She was one of the few executives that we knew when we moved to L.A. in like 92. Uh -huh. and she said, she said, look, I like their group, but I like your songs, but I don't like your group. And I like that group, but I don't like their songs. And uh -huh. I said, I'll put you in the studio together. And if you guys come up with something, I'll sign the group and let your guys produce the records. Wow. And so we went in over the, over like, like the Easter weekend and cut a whole bunch of records. This is like, like early 93, right? Spring uh -huh. of 93. Okay. And we go in the studio, we cut a bunch of records. None of it good enough to get a deal. But what it did is it brought us together. And so from that, we ended up coming together. Tab ended up being one of my best friends in the industry for all those years. I called myself managing these guys briefly for a second. Rob went on to do tremendous things. And yeah. Sam ended up moving to Atlanta with us and got a deal uh -huh. with, uh, with LaFace. So we kind of okay. came together through, through that situation. And I kind of built a relationship with those guys. And I've known those guys, you know, still been around those guys and still see them all the time. Wow, and, and we talked about what's that almost thirty years ago. And let me and let me tell you what I got out of all, out of all, out of, out of everything you just said. Tab can sing. I didn't know. No, that's the funny thing. It can't <laughs> sing. And I remember, I remember. So Kook is Kook is cutting their vocals, right? Uh -huh. And Kook Kook comes and gets me out. He comes and pulls me out. And comes out the studio and goes, "Yo, man, this guy right here, because he's cutting the vocals on the guys." And he's like, "Man, this guy right here can't sing at all." Like, and this was, you got to say, this is before Pro Tools and all that, like all yeah. the tricks and stuff. Yeah. Like, you either had it or you didn't. And and I remember, I was like, so he's like, man, I don't want to waste my time. We don't really have a lot of time. So I went and talked to him. I was like, man, just come on out. Don't worry about singing. Like, we just uh -huh. going to work with these other three guys right now. So after after their group disbanded and our group disbanded, we started working together. I came to tab. I was like, look, like, you need to stop with this facade of singing. And I said, me and you need to just manage <laughs> Sam together, yeah. and that's what we did. Uh -huh. We started, he and Tap and I started managing uh, Sam Salter together. And then, fast forward many years later, uh, uh, Tab was the one who discovered, at least for us, I'm not saying he discovered him in the, in the world, but discovered uh -huh. uh, Frank Ocean and wow. signed, him, signed him to a publishing deal when Tab was consulting for Windswept and called me and said, Man, this guy's gonna need a manager, um, you know, with his songwriting. And, you know, that's my expertise as managing songwriters and producers. And I was listening to his music on a Saturday, and I said, man, this is really good, but it sounds like an artist project. I think he's uh -huh. an artist. And I had never seen him. I was like, what's wrong with him? Does he look funny or something? Like, what's his deal? And he's <laughs> yeah. like, no, nah, he's, he's like a, like a cool-looking cat. And so, uh -huh. like, so Tab has always had that, that, that ear and that eye for talent, and we've always just sort of worked together. Where we, whether we were working together at Red Zone, he's, you know, we consider him one of the founders of Red Zone. He was there yeah. the day we sort of established ourselves, and then he's gone on and you know, now he's at uh, BMG and consulting yeah. for people. So, you know, he's always done his own thing, but we always still work together. That's awesome, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Man. That's, <laughs> I never knew that. That's wild. So let yeah. me ask you this now. Um, how is it, because, um, you know, you, 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 uh, you've done a lot of work with your brothers. How is it, because first of all, shout out to Laney and Tricky. You know, I, I, yeah. I, What's I, up, I, guys? I don't want to forget that. that. But um, how is it working with your brothers, man? Is it... um? Because I know they're, they're, they both have got a lot of work out here, and I know you're tied into a lot of what they do. Um, yeah. So I'm like, but I, how is it working with them, man? Like, because you very seldom <laughs> find you very seldom find a family, yeah. especially of brothers like how you guys are. You guys, and I know from just personal experience how closely knitted you guys are. You know how close you are. So, but how yeah. is it working doing business with your brothers like that? Um, it, <laughs> there's some challenges. You know, I, the thing I tell people, particularly about. It's kind of, I split it in two ways. So Laney put us all on. So I wouldn't have a world, a life in the music industry if it wasn't for Laney. 
So he sort of always holds a different place. Um, in the beginning, Lenny had other managers because I was a youngster. I didn't know what was going on. And so mm -hmm. one day he let me manage him. And okay. uh, we did okay. You know, we did okay for a minute. And uh -huh. then we'll get in an argument. And then he'll fire me. And then we'll make up. <laughs> and then I tell, I tell my mom. And then my mom, like, all right, y'all got to work this out. And then he'll rehire me. So I've been, like, hired and, re and, hired and fired from Lenny like 10 times. <laughs> so for my brothers, no matter what, for Lady all the time. So whether I have, yeah. Manager, oh, he has a really good man. young manager. Uh huh. Uh, he has a really good young manager that he works with, a guy named uh, Ty Perry. But he runs everything about me, and, and okay. Tricky and I have been Tricky and I have been working together since I was nineteen, and he was fifteen. And I tell people all the time, we grew up, mm -hmm. we shared a room together when we lived in my lived in my mother's house. I've literally been with him every day of my life, and now we're old and gray. You know what I mean? So that's that's the complexities of <laughs> right. when you yeah. work with somebody. But like I literally been with my brother every day for his entire life, and all but four years of mine. So. That comes wow. with challenges, wow. okay. Okay. and it's, some shit is cool, and some shit's you know, like you fight and you argue in ways that I wouldn't with normal <laughs> clients. And he says things, of course, that, yeah. like to me that he wouldn't say to a normal manager. But you know, but we, the thing he always knows is that I always have his back in business, and so that he can be free and be creative. And ultimately, that has a lot to do with why he's been able to have so much success. Right, right, and that's very important, man. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah. And and um, now you, you guys, you guys have been in um, you guys have been involved in a lot of big records, man. Um, uh, what was? Let me ask you this before we go any further with the uh with the placements. I'm gonna ask you, what was the first major placement that you got as a as management? Can you remember? Um, I think the, the very. Hey, man, they all major. If they pay, they major. Um. That's always been my thing. <laughs> right, um, that's right. That's right. Uh, we made records for. We made <laughs> Laney's first. I wasn't managing Laney, but the first sort of check that we got it was an artist by the name. God, I'm gonna date myself because nobody knows this artist, but her name was uh, Alex Brown. She was signed to MCA Records in the late '80s, and that was Laney's uh -huh. first placement. And I think I want to say Tricky and Kook's first placement was on i want to say on immature when they were on virgin oh, okay. um before they went to mca and became imx i think that was their first cut oh uh -huh. no and, or it might have been like the baby's kids soundtrack it was like it was like 91 like whenever it was or i think it was this kid trey and it was all like 90 91 was like the first you know the first like records we got cut were like in, wow. Yeah, it was, or it was real early in those days. I don't remember exactly. It's it's a little bit of a blur. I don't remember which one. It was like a group of records that yeah. happened around the same time. I have no idea which one was first. Got you, got you, got you. Now, 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 moving forward, you um, you guys were you guys were successful at building um an entertainment company called Red Zone, man. How did that come about? How did how did you guys? How, let me let me start like this. How did Red Zone form? And then how did you get it? How did you brand it and get it to where it is right now? What was that process? Well, before that, let me let me just walk you up to the moment because I would be I would be doing dishonor to my cousin Sean K, okay. who is a producer as well. Okay. Uh, in addition to a bunch of stuff, he did. Um, God, he did three uh, LW. He did their two hits um, okay. years ago. Haters gonna hate and players gonna play. He did that record and the whole mm -hmm. nine. But him, him and Tricky were production partners. Okay. Uh, in the early days in Chicago and. And then when they moved to Atlanta, they moved together. And they had a company called Boss Productions. And okay. they were together. It was them two, Tricky and Sepp, as a production team. And then as their relationship started to go and branch off in about 1994, 95, mm -hmm. is when Red Tone formed. Um, okay. And that was, like I said, that was really myself, um, Tricky, and Tab were sort of the key players in that in the formation of that company. Tab kind of did the A and R function, uh -huh. um, you know, found artists, wrote songs, that whole bit, and then I did the business function. And Tricky was was producing, um, and so we built from there. And that was sort of the sort of how Red Zone started. So I want to say around '95, which was right around the time we moved to Atlanta. So we right. got to Atlanta, 
Tricky and Seth were still together and then ended up sort of breaking up at the beginning of our time here in Atlanta. So the building that you've been to, we, yeah. we got into that in 95, formed Red Zone right about that time and then started wow. doing a whole bunch of projects under the Red Zone umbrella. Cause I got there, I got there with it like what, I got there in two thousand. Was it two thousand? Yeah, about two. I was gonna say ninety nine, two thousand. Two yeah. thousand. Yeah, I, that's yeah. when I came on the scene. So I, we have been we have been there about five years at that point. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. And, and just so everybody knows, just so everybody knows, like I want I want the people that's watching to know uh, how much of a um of, of a role you and your brothers played in in my life at that time in, in two thousand because I had just moved here from Detroit. Right. And um I didn't have anything going on, man. I, and I ran into a guy that you guys know. I'm about to make you go. I'm about to take your mind back here. I ran into a guy that, that you guys know called Jarvis. Jarvis, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I ran into Jarvis over at noontime, and I was over there doing a session. And Jarvis, asked, he was like, "Man, you sign anybody?" I was like, "Nah." He said, "Let me introduce you to my guys." I'm like, "All right." So yeah. I hopped in his little car, <laughs> and he took me <laughs> over to the studio, man. And I, and I met you guys, and the rest is history. Yeah. And yeah, no, it was dope. You had listen, you did the you you had dope stuff. You know, your music was fire, and 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 actually, when you came in, you were bringing something that we didn't have already in the building. You had an edge to your music; it hit hard. And um, you know, we were like an R and you know, we were traditional sort of R and B thing. Uh -huh. You were too, but your beat, your drums and stuff just hit hard. So I think that was sort of the initial tr attraction. Uh, you were a great musician, but you also had like really super hard beats and the whole night. So you fit right in, and, and you and Laney start to vibe immediately. Yeah, because yeah, because uh, then uh, I ended up signing to Laney's uh, yeah uh, situation shop the world, but mm -hmm. it, it was just it was still our family, even though even though I was signed to him, it was yeah we, 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 yeah we, we all like, yeah it's all a collective in terms of how yeah. we tried to attack things. That was always my mentality. It was like I like all we were trying to do was make the building hot. Yeah, yeah. We wanted yeah. we wanted fourteen ten to be hot. It was we hot. Who, we didn't care who it was coming from. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. definitely on fire. We it was it was myself, and then um, the back room was Boo Too. That was Jason yeah. Bieber and uh, Focus. And Focus. Yeah, and then yeah. across the hall, Shakespeare. That's when Shakespeare, Shakespeare was there. Yeah. When he was doing those scrubs and bills, bills, yeah. bills, and you know, so everywhere you went in that building was heat. We it had a hot lot. building. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. in that particular moment too. That that was a very very hot moment for us. Um, from when we were doing Maya, we had KCDX, yeah. we had, you know, we had Mance too. Like, real talk, Laney did the record that sort of revamped Charlie Wilson's career. Uh, Laney and Tab and Tracy Hale wrote this song called Without You. Uh -huh. And uh, that was the number one urban contemporary record for Charlie when Charlie had cleaned up his life and turned his life around. He made that record and he's been going crazy you know, yeah. ever since, like a string of adult hits and playing major tours and all of that. And to Laney's credit and, and, and Tab and uh, Tracy's credit, they made the first record that started that run. Yeah, wow, wow, that's crazy, man. Yeah. yeah. Great records, great records. Now, let me ask you this. Speaking of speaking of songs, what, in your opinion, uh, what, in your opinion, makes a great song? Well, how is a great song made? Well, I think, I think there's, I mean, that's, there's a lot of different people that can answer that question. Uh, in different ways and sort of mm -hmm. arrive at the same thing. For me, uh -huh. um, I've always, I, there's magical records that like, you know, press play records where you sort of know that you're hearing something special uh -huh. in the first five or six seconds. Uh -huh. um, but those records are hard to come by. If they were easy, yeah. everybody would do them, you right. know, all the time. You know, to me, you always just, I still think Melody drives, you yeah. know, like I think Melody drives, like, like you listen to the, the, um, what's the kid? He's got the, um, God, now I'm going to draw a blank. Uh, Roddy Rich, That yeah. Roddy Rich record. Uh -huh. Like, the crazy thing about that record, and I don't know what the hell that kid is talking about, but the <laughs> melodies are crazy. The melodies are sick. And I think, yeah. I think the melodies are the reason why that's at number one for so long. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because people yeah. can sing along to, I think it's the ability to sing along to a record is yes. still the thing that attracts people most to a song. Now, there are songs that are not very melodically uh, pleasing, that have great lyrics, and sometimes that's the reason that some, re some records went off beat uh, uh -huh. and the beats are hit. But to me, the greatest songs of all time are ones that an artist can damn near put the mic out and let the crowd sing it. Yes. That's how memorable the melodies are. Yes, know? yes, yes. So. Now, now, now you, you guys were, uh, you, you were a part of a major record that Rihanna did called Umbrella, man. Let me ask you this, because yeah. I've, I've always wanted to know this. Um, after Tricky produced the record, and after the record was recorded, mixed, and put out, and, it, and and the success came with it, 
what what was that like for you guys, man? Like, was what was this? I know it was a crazy celebration to to have a record that big, you know, in your clutch like that. You know what I'm saying? So I'm I got. I, I don't know if you got enough time. I got. <laughs> there's so many umbrella stories. Um, <laughs> before I get to the celebration, I, I'll briefly kind of tell you leading it right. Okay. The story. So. You know, when you, it, like, we've been doing this for a long time, 30 years. So in 30-something uh -huh. years, 31 years, actually, um, there's ups and downs. You have hot moments. You have moments that you cool off. And yeah. we were coming off a really, really cold moment. We had we had done Britney Spears. We did Me Against the Music in 2003. Mm -hmm. And then 2004, 5, and 6 just got really, really quiet for us. We were doing records, but nothing was sticking. And it just got, it got quiet. It got cold. And we, huh. we really, we really needed that record. And in that particular year, 2006, my dad who used to work with us, he died. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he passed away August 1st, 2006. Okay. So it was a really just downtime. He had been sick, suffering with cancer. And so uh -huh. it was really like a downtime. So we were coming out of that period and they wrote that song. It was like, it was a game changer, a life changer yeah. in so many ways. Not just mm -hmm. like, like we were cold as ice <laughs> and we uh -huh. needed a hit uh -huh. bad. And we got one. It was kook. Dream and Tricky uh -huh. came together over uh, the Christmas break, which is usually very, as you know, a very quiet time yeah. at a lot of studios, like, you know, because people are going home and they're with the families and stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. And those guys were around because they were like, look, we cold, you know, we just, it, it wasn't so much like they, creative people don't look at it like cold hot. I'm talking some manager shit. Right, but right, right, right. They were like, we're hungry. We need to make something happen, right? Gotcha. So they yeah. were at the studio. They're grinding. They're making it. They're they're doing their best, and they land on that record. I remember getting a call at the house, like, "Yo, we got something." They played it for me over the phone, uh -huh. and I was like, "Yo, that's crazy!" I was about to jump in the car. You know, when you hit them, when you hit them hot ones, you jump in the car <laughs> and go to the studio. He's like, "No, nah, don't come down. We about to leave. Uh -huh. Just come up here tomorrow around noon, and you can hear it in person then." So uh -huh. I, that's exactly what I did. I um, I jumped in the thing, and I said, "Man, I think this is a hit." Uh -huh. So I literally, along with everybody, Jazzy Faye was in the building at the time. Jazzy, I remember Jazzy was taking the record and running it around everywhere. And I was sending it to, you know, people that I knew and going, I sent it to Britney Spears and I sent it to, you know, like all just people like, yo, like, this is a great record. I think you should do yeah. it. Because I think originally when they wrote it, they wrote it for Britney. Okay. And, but, and I, I sent it the, sort of the last thing. And I think it was sort of a combination between Jazzy's I think Jazzy had played it in New York for the label. And then I sent it to Karen Kwok, who was the EVP at the time. And I said, look, I got this great record. Make sure L.A. Reid hears this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he heard it. While that was happening, uh, Chris Hicks had played the record for Mary J. Blige, who was like literally about to win a gazillion Grammys. Yeah. And probably wasn't going to come out for a while. Uh -huh. So that particular Grammys year, so they wrote that record in January of 2007. Uh -huh. That end of that February, Tricky and I went out to LA just to do meetings and see people. We had a hot record in our pocket and we knew a bunch of people, but we were trying to make it happen. We were parlaying, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so we went out there and the phone's blowing up. You know, Jay Brown's calling me, puts Rihanna on the phone with me. And she's like, you know, I want this record. I love this song. You got to give it to me. And, and me and Trick were like, we didn't really know what to do. We just knew that whatever this record was, it had to turn it all around for us. Right. Like, it had to. So right. I remember we sat up, we was at the bar having some drinks and just trying to figure it out. And we said, we made a commitment to, like, and I never really tell this story, but th I'm telling you story from my perspective. Uh -huh. Tricky and I made a commitment to whoever shows the most urgency can have the record. Like, we need somebody who's going to take it and run with it right now today because right. we needed a hit right then. Right. And this was like February, whatever the Grammys are, so like mid to late February. February, yeah, uh-huh. So long story short, long story longer, Rihanna cuts the record. It's It comes out amazing. They put it out immediately. By that spring, like late March, early April, it was like number one in the UK. And wow. I remember we had this big celebration. We were out in LA working, and at this point now everything's heated up. And we sat by the pool, and we celebrated we got to the pool for like breakfast and uh -huh. we started drinking champagne in the morning and the champagne turned into shots and shots turned into <laughs> more champagne. And we literally sat there from about 11 in the morning to about sundown to about like seven, six thirty, seven o'clock. 
and ran up like for real we ran up about six thousand dollars worth of drink bills a week <laughs> and and uh we we made them split it between two def jam executives so we didn't even pay for it <laughs> that's how you do it that's how you yeah. do it <laughs> the, Shakir, the late Shakir store, may you rest in peace, pay for half of it, and Karen Kwok paid for the other half. Shakir, rest in peace, Shakir. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes. Now, 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 moving on to another record that, that I love that you guys um, uh, uh, did, Single Ladies. Yes. The the success of that was, was I want to, it might have been greater than Umbrella. I don't know, but. Uh, yeah, well, Umbrella will always hold a special place in our heart because it was sort of the one that sort of, like, launched us. Yeah. But while all that was going on, uh, we made that record. We didn't make that record, but Trick and Dream and the team, like those guys, Trick and Dream just went on a tremendous run. Uh -huh. um, Kook, you know, they made that record and won a Grammy for that record for Song uh -huh. of the Year. You know, I was in there. It was like the most, I got to That Grammy is probably like the most nervous I've ever been. I'm sitting in the, sitting in the audience and we were there the year before uh -huh. and we lost uh, okay. with Rihanna. We won a couple. But we uh, we didn't win the ones that would have let my guys go on the stage. Right, you know, so right. The song right. category and the record category. I think they won Best Rap Song Collaboration, Jay-Z, and uh, Rihanna won that. Okay. So we're there the next year. And I was pissed. Like, you know, people think, oh, it's cool to be nominated. Like, that's, that's just not real. When you get in that situation, <laughs> you, you want to win. You want to win. Point blank, you want to win that Grammy, right? So, right, right. <laughs> that next year, the, so you don't know how they're going to run this. Though. So we're sitting in a thing, and they go, First word of the night is for song of the year, which is crazy because it's like, why is song of the year the first award? Uh -huh. So all of a sudden, I know that's one of our categories, one of our big categories. So uh -huh. now I'm like, I feel like I'm about to faint. You know what I mean? Because like uh -huh. the tension is building and the way they, if you go back and YouTube it, they announce it. They don't just say the song or song of the year because it's a songwriter award. Okay. So they say them in order, alphabetical order of the people on the song or something like okay. that. So I think the first thing, you know, because you don't really know, like they, they said single ladies, and then they said, that is Sorrell. And so as soon as they said my cousin's name, I knew that was us. Uh -huh. So then I just like, I, I don't even know what I did. I just jumped up. You know, I'd be on some athletic shit. So I jumped <laughs> up like, yeah, you know, I'm like grabbing and whatnot. So I was super lit and, and tricked and then went up on stage because Beyonce couldn't come up because she was about to perform. So okay. if you go back and look at that video, like only Kook and, and Trick and Dream go up on the stage to accept mm. that award. And okay. I got thanked from the Grammy stage. And that was awesome. Managers never get thanked from a Grammy stage. That's one of the one of the uh, cool vibes about having your brother yeah. win a Grammy is that he he thanked me and my wife from uh, from the stage. Which was that's awesome. what's up. That's what's yeah. up. And then not now. With the, with, were you guys privileged enough to actually be in the studio with Beyonce when she recorded it, or was it a situation where you sent her the record and she did it? How did that work out? No, like on that particular record, um, I personally wasn't there, but my guys were there, and okay. I was. I've been I've been around in the studio when she was recording, not like sitting in there, but I've been there and uh, uh -huh. she's a, like a tireless worker. Like no, I don't know anybody works as hard as she does. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, you know I mean? I'm not, I'm not claiming that we're like best friends or anything, but I've, right. I've seen her operate and it's like, yeah. it would freak you out. Like the amount of hours that she just puts in, like, wow. like no breaks, no yeah. stoppage, no nothing. She just goes hard. But no, nah, that was, the, um, I think, you know, Tricky and Dream can tell and share that story better. Maybe you get them on. They'll you know get Trick on. He'll uh, he'll explain that because I wasn't there when they made that record. I um, okay. heard the story, but I, I don't. That's their story to tell, not mine. Wow. Okay. Now let me ask you this, man. Moving forward, what what? Because I just asked you what what makes a great song. What, in your opinion, makes a great artist? Uh man, I think a lot of it is um, it, and it's different. I think that. That that has changed over the years because yeah. the the um back in the day, an artist literally just had to worry about if they played an instrument, their just sort of their ability to master that, uh -huh. uh, sing live, their ability to master that. Um, but now it's like artists got to be dope at social media. Yeah. <laughs> they got to be dope at like creative visions for videos and content yeah. because now there's such a flood of material that's out there that people have to differentiate themselves. So. One of the things that we look for is, you know, normal things. Can you sing? Can you dance? You know, all that kind of stuff. But it's also like the 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 discipline and the hard work and the dedication. Yeah. You know, the work ethic is like because that's listen. I know for a fact how hard Beyonce is working at what she does. I uh -huh. know how hard Bruno's working at what he does. Like when you look at all the big stars, I know how hard 
Drake is going, all of, and then yeah. these rap. Let's we even talk about. It. I'm in the. I'm from the R&B pop world, uh -huh. but we're not even talking about the work ethic of these rappers. Like yeah. everybody, like people have such a misconception of rap artists because they think, you know, they think they see it and they think it's all like popping champagne and having fun. Right, these guys right. make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs to arrive at what they're doing, and they never stop recording. So, like the guys in the rap world, they they actually have changed the culture of how hard artists work. Because now R&B kids got to work like rappers. That's what we say all the time. You got I'm looking for R&B singers and pop singers that work like rappers. Right, right, right. You're absolutely right about that. And, and it definitely has changed. Um, Except North Carolina. You know, from uh, from the time that, even from the time I started uh, making beats and up until now, man, it's like, it's just totally, like I always say now that um, Instagram is the new A&R, you know? <laughs> sure. You It'll know? tell like, you a lot. I mean, TikTok, you know, all these platforms, they'll tell you a lot about what you got before yeah. you ever have to go talk to a record company. And I, I think in many ways, it's different for uh, for those of us from the from the old days, we have uh -huh. to make an adjustment. But I think for kids now, it's actually kind of cool because you don't have to go through these buffers to, right. to find right. out if you got something. Now, the difference being, we didn't have to compete with as many people because the gatekeepers kept so much of the bullshit out. Right. And only the really quality got to get through. That's now right. everything gets through, so the competition is out there and it's yeah. it's everywhere. And sometimes even records and artists that are not that great catch a moment and they pop yes. through and they occupy time and space. And then that keeps somebody else out that's maybe more authentically talented but hasn't found that record that breaks through. So it's like there's a lot more sort of complexities that go with the game today that yeah. people have to deal with, but there's less people telling you you can't. Right. You know what I, I mean? Like, I'll tell you something that I noticed too, not to cut you off, but I, um, something that I noticed is like, um, cause when I first started, when I first, cause I was, I was a musician first, I traveled on the road for many, many years. Then I got off into production. And, um, when I first got off into production, uh, Mark, it was like, I felt like, um, it might've been maybe, and I'm not literally saying this, but I'm saying it just felt like it might've been maybe me and 10 other guys making beats. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then, yeah, then I look it was up, more than that, but it felt like that. It yeah. felt like that, right. Yeah. And, that, and then I look up and 10, 15 years later, I'm like, everybody's making beats now. It's like, yes. you know. Your, you, you, your you, teacher, you, like if you're in school, your teacher probably make beats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's where we are now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, nah, listen, like I said, it's, it's the gift and the curse. I don't, it ain't for me to be mad about it or whatever. Right. You have to be, you have to adjust. And yeah. I think as an executive, it's cool because it really puts a lot on the artist. You know, mm -hmm. like um, I see Kissy Lee in here. I'll use her as, as a great example. I see how hard she works. I met her. She co-wrote a song that we did a couple years ago. With, that's when I met her. Uh -huh. But this is an artist that just constantly works, constantly puts out content. And uh -huh. for executives, those are the traits that you're looking for. Like you're uh -huh. you're watching. You're you're on the gram watching like who's doing what, who's putting work in, who's getting yeah. down, like who's not. And yeah. so it's just a matter of changing your focus in terms of how you look. It used to be like somebody come over and they're going to sing for you. And if they had a good day, they might get signed. Yeah. But now yeah. it's like, do you have Thanks. a good nine months on, on social media? Right. Like it takes a lot more and a lot more effort for artists to get through. And I see the ones, we see it because it's all out in front of everybody. Now, you know, you, you spent some time at Epic Records as an exec. So um, what, yeah. was that like? what was that like for you, man? What was it, was it, how was the transition from going from, you know, Red Zone, managing Red Zone to Epic Records? Not to say Red Zone is not uh, uh, yeah. in the other no, no, this, is. Is, this is a major corporation. It was a, it was an international company. Epic yeah. Records is a division of Sony, which is a, a Japanese company operating in America. It was very different. Um, was it was I mean, it was it harder? Was it harder than just? just I mean, just okay, so here, okay, so I'll give you, I'll give it to you, I'll give you both sides, right? Okay. The first thing I hadn't had a job. I hadn't worked for anybody. I, like I told you earlier, I started when this when I was nineteen years old. Uh -huh. The previous job I had before that, I was working at Bennigan's when I was in high school. <laughs> okay. The next job, the next job I had was executive vice president of A and R at Epic Records. Like, wow. like other than working for myself and for yeah. for my partners. Right. Like, I never had to work for anybody else. So the biggest challenge for me was actually playing the game for someone else's, like, scorebook, for someone yeah. else's scoreboard. So, for instance, 
we would have a record. We did, when we first got to Epic, we did the um, Think Like a Man soundtrack, the very first one. Okay. And John Legend had a song on there that went for it, that went, and it was cool. It was like, oh, shit, we got a number one, I think it was like a number one uh, R&B mainstream record. Uh -huh. And, you know, in, in my world, man, we get a number one record. We shutting it down for a week or two. I might yeah. go on vacation. Right. We popping champagne for like endless amounts of days. We're just really, <laughs> and, I, and I'm exaggerating, but we're enjoying yeah. it. You're soaking it yeah, up. I, I when you work, yeah. when you work at a record company, you enjoy a hit record like half a day. Like wow. they have like half a day. They'll be like, oh, look what we did, and then then everybody's back into what's the next thing on the schedule release. So in my department, I ran operations. They're literally, and so I'm kind of interacting with every other department, and I'm literally like going, wait, so we <laughs> we not celebrating Think Like a Man no more? Like, uh -huh. and this was like two days after, like, no, nah, they're uh -huh. like, what's next? So that was sort of one of the greatest challenges. And I think just sort of being on someone else's time, someone else's agenda. Now, the cool thing yeah. was I was working for L.A. Reid, who yeah. I'd known for, you know, at that point, 20, 25 years. So yeah. that wasn't, you know, my, I reported directly to him. So we it was cool that part of okay. it was cool but for the most part it was just different playing for somebody else and it was one of the reasons why i came back i only spent two years inside and i could have stayed uh -huh. I, I actually enjoyed working with la i didn't enjoy living in new york but i loved working with la it was just i was used to doing my own thing i was used to if we did well i knew i could close as a manager like if i had a hit I know how to parlay that into, and this is not a flex, but I know how to parlay that into millions of dollars for my clients. Uh -huh. And when you work at a record company, your salary is your salary, no matter what it is. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? So, yeah. Because I came from an eat what you kill world, uh -huh. I was kind of still comfortable with eating what I kill. Like I, I was getting a great salary and it was fly, but I would rather get what I got. And then when you had a big win, then you had a big win and you can yeah. parlay that as opposed to, you get your thing and then, you know, maybe get a bonus, you know, every year or something like that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's crazy, man. Now let me ask you this. Um, what, uh, what advice would you give, um, any upcoming artists or producers, whatever, what, what advice, how, how, how do you stay out of, how do you stay away from a bad deal, man? What, what are some of the key points that you would give somebody to, to, to let them keep them away from? Cause there's a lot of, we, we all know there's a lot of sharks out here. You know. Yeah, I think, I mean, because here's the thing, and, I, and I, I've been asked that question, or co I've contemplated that question many times. I don't really know the concept of bad deal, good deal. Uh -huh. I think there's people who are cl clearly and obviously trying to take advantage of people. Uh -huh. And I think you use your gut, um, and you know when that feels, when it feels wrong. I think you're supposed to have a lawyer. I don't think anybody should ever sign their name to anything without having a, uh, an entertainment lawyer right. review your document. I've seen people go and give their shit to a, a corporate lawyer or a lawyer who does real estate. And, yeah, yeah. and they look at it and go, yeah, this looks okay to me. And now yeah. you're committed to things and then you're upset. So if you do that, like, it's like buyer beware. Shame on you. I don't have no, I don't feel any way about that. Like, you got to get a lawyer. My advice to everybody is get an attorney. Um, surround yourself. Don't let people manage you just because they're the homie and they be around and they bob their head, head to your music. It's not what a manager is. A yes. manager is somebody who can advise you correctly in the things that you should do. Right. Um, too many times, and, and I was lucky. I got to manage at a time when I probably wasn't good enough to, uh -huh. but I was also super diligent about learning how to be a good manager. There's nothing more humbling than being a 20 or 21 year old kid walking into a meeting with Jimmy Iovine, which I did thinking that I'm managing and guys like that who sit with the Irving Azoffs of the world and the, and the Elliot Roberts and people like that. And they look uh -huh. at you and they go, you don't do what Irving Azoff does, but right. you don't know that. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, but <laughs> so I wanted, my whole thing was like, I want to learn so that I can play and gain the respect of those type of guys. You know what I'm well, saying? But yes. when you're 20, it's hard. And if you give that power to the homie, he better be working as hard at being a great manager as yeah. you are at being a great artist. Absolutely. Like, because yeah. if he's just there rolling blunts, man, fuck, I'm, excuse me, I'm like, fuck that no, guy. Yeah, don't yeah, put your, no, don't that's, put that's, your, that's your career in that guy's hands. That's facts right there, man. That, that's, that's facts, yeah, because it, it, it's, um, all it does is keep you down, man. You know, it, it, yeah. and, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure, it, and, I, and I always say this, I, 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 um, 
I relate the music industry to basketball a lot. And, and I always say, you know, what's the use in, in playing in the league for 10, 15, 20 years and you never win a ring? You know what right. I'm saying? It's like, you know, like you get the money, you might get yeah. the money. But, and, and I, I believe a lot of that is because of people, like you just said, getting their homeboys. Hey, man, come, you know, people who really don't know what they're doing. Right. But they, because I, because we grew up together and right. because, you know, you sold dope and you, and you were good at selling dope back in the day. I'm right. going to equate that to you being a good manager. It doesn't work. Yeah, like and that. I think, listen, I'm not saying cut your friends off. Like, I think there's yeah. just, you can't let them have the most important conversations related right. to your career. You right. know, like, if, you, if, you, if you're if you grinding as a producer, an artist, or a songwriter, yeah. and then you find yourself in key meetings and key opportunities, like, you're better off just sitting there as a client, as a, as a creator, and going, hey, let me just take a pause. I don't know about 90% of what you guys are talking about. But let me go get my act together. Let me go put some people around me so I can handle this situation. Yes. But a lot of times it'd be like, man, come over here with me. And then you end up with somebody in a conversation that they don't belong in. Exactly. Or at least that's, I know that's how it is for some people. Yeah. Just put your, put your career in the hands of people who literally know what they're doing. Not the car they drive, not right. how much jewelry they have on. Right. But people who really truly understand the ins and outs of the industry and can and can articulate that through you know some conversations and you probably want don't want to choose a manager in one conversation but maybe over a series of conversations they've exhibited the ability to be able to articulate what it takes to advance somebody's career and if they can't articulate that then they're just not your manager good advice man that's, that's awesome advice man and um so let me ask you this what would you um wh which side are you on what, what what would you recommend would you recommend indie or major because it's a lot of people out here. It's a, it's a lot of artists out here who um, they feel like indie is the you know you, it's a split decision. I, I hear some artists talk about how they want to get signed to a major so badly because of X, Y, and Z. But you know the indie route is also a, a, a route that you can take that yeah. can be beneficial to your artistry as well. So which one? Would you, um, which team you on? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not really on either team in terms of what I would recommend. I think each situation is different. Uh -huh. The style of music you make has something to do with that. Like, I, okay. I, the mistake that I think a lot of artists, let's talk about the indie side for a minute. Okay. The thing that I see a lot with indie with indie artists, and I've never had a, a big indie success. All my successes have happened as part of a label in, infrastructure. So that's what I know. Good. But I've seen artists blow up independently. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I wish the business thing would kick in. Mm -hmm. So they would look at that and go, wait, we got a chance. Because if they're going, here's why I look at it logically. If you build an asset, whether you as an artist or your team builds an asset that they're willing to offer you two, three million dollars for it because now it's blown up independently, uh -huh. then you have to just logically think this is probably worth five times that. Yeah. If I put the work yeah. in. Now, if you're completely incapable of getting yourself to the next level, sign the deal, take the money. And, and now understand that you're in their business doing their deeds yeah. on that side. Yeah. It, but if you have the, like, there's a lot of really smart people getting smarter about how to operate independently. Uh -huh. Sometimes I wonder why they go give any part of their stuff. And maybe sometimes guys now are a little bit smarter. They're going doing distribution deals. Yeah. They're going to do P&D deals at 80, 20, mm -hmm. 85, 15, and keeping the control, but then getting some services from the label. That's what I would suggest. So I don't think it's a, cut and dry like major no major but yeah. i think be smart don't just take a bunch of front money and now you're just in the label doing the labels business always stay in business for yourself for yeah. as long as you can if you can you know that right. that like i said i'm saying that from the point of view of somebody who has never had any independent success all my success has been inside the structure of a label but i see these guys build this build these assets up and i'll be like man let me build something like that independently yeah. and i just put all because i know the guys who work the records i know the digital guys i'll just go uh -huh. hire everybody and keep my shit got you got you that's great yeah. man now you yeah. know what i want to switch gears real quick okay uh, I'm, I'm gonna get a little political with you right now man um because uh, uh -oh. we, let's see we got we got nine minutes left so that's enough okay. time so check this out um uh i know you've heard in the news about the the slaying of um Ahmad Arbery, yeah, um, and, and and I'm bringing this up, and, and this may seem like a, it's a night and day situation, right? But I'm, I'm only bringing this. Up. I, I asked all my um, my guests this 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 question um, since it happened. 
what is your take on the slaying of that young black man, man? Because it seems like what's trying to happen is they're trying to sweep it under the rug as much as they can. You know what I'm sure. saying? Sure. And, uh, I mean, that's what's been happening again and again and again. And thank God for social media. Thank God yeah. for people who have chosen to dedicate their social media platforms to bringing um, light to situations like this. Because the truth of the matter is, these things wouldn't be in front of you or I if it wasn't for people who, like, literally, they've become investigative. Like, we don't call them that. Right. But these guys, some of these guys have become investigative reporters, the type that would work yes. for a network back in the day. Yes. And, yes. and as a result, they're bringing light to it. That's the only, the light is the only reason there's been indictments in this most recent case. Yes. But this is going on for a while. I think, it, since you went political, I'm going to say this, and then right. I'm going I'm to get off of it quickly, because I'll get on a, I'll get on a, uh, on a soapbox. <laughs> but I think that, sure. like, we have to do, we got to get sick enough to really, I'm of the belief that you have to avail yourself thoroughly and completely of the process. I'm not one of these people like, stay home, don't vote, mm -hmm. do this, do that. Nah, like, there's a, we are being hunted. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and it's because the tone is being set from, from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Yes, the sir. The tone is being set there. Yes. And, and people have gotten to this place where they almost are convincing themselves that they're cool to live with four more years of that because they think they're making a point about what their vote turned towards the Democrats are, the Democratic right. Party, right? Right. So my feeling is this. We live in a two-party system. That's not going to change between now and November 3rd. So you got to pick a side and understand that staying home or voting for Trump is virtually the same thing. Because you know what Republicans are not about to do? They're not about to miss the election. No. They're going to be out there rain, sleet, or snow. They're going to be out there in, in, in yeah. huge numbers. Yeah. Getting yeah. their guy in. And I'm talking about the election because I think things like that, and it's not just at voting at the presidential level, but it's down ballot, that changes the tone of how the country's even functioning. Yes. You look at some of the dysfunction that's happening in the country, even with law enforcement, um, vigilantism. Like, these guys weren't police officers or not right. active police officers. Right. These are guys that are just jumped in a car like it was like the 50s or the 40s and just ran them down and killed them. And and like this is right here in Georgia, right? So yes. we are here and we we can't just sit back and chill. We got to feel some type of way. And I think you have to, my thing has always been you have to hit these things on multiple levels. We yes. have to march. We have to be socially active. We got to do that. But we also have to legislate. We yes. also have to hit at every level. And we have to spend money. I'm yes. saying, reaching out to all my people who have money, we can't talk about a black agenda that we don't want to put our money behind. That's when people it. put, government is moved That's by it. money. We want a black agenda. Let's put a, 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 a polit political action committee or lobbyist or whatever uh -huh. out there in Washington, D.C. And let's go lobby some of these people to do the things that we want. But just marching, Marching ain't gonna do it. Like we gotta puff. I heard put Pete, Diddy and everybody. Let's put some money together. Those yeah. folks who have it. Let's put some money together and let's get an agenda pushed through and make these senators and, and these congressmen listen to what we're saying because we're putting some money over their head. And, and really, really, I'm glad you said that because you you really answered my following question, which was what can America, what can we as a, as Black America do to make a change with this this racial tone? Because it's really, I mean, it's it's always been out of control, but it just seems like here lately. Like you just said, it's like they're, they're trying to take us back to the 50s and 60s, yeah. you know, with this, this, this nonsense, man. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this in a literal sense, but it just seems like in a minute you're going to be riding down the street and see us hanging from trees again. You yeah, know? no, I feel, it feels like it's, it's so much boldness out here. Like, you know, you still from time to time see the, the Confederate flag and yeah. all that old stuff. And I, my approach is, and I see people talking about both parties take us for granted and, you know, all of that. I get that. But what I'm about... I believe in associating economic power mm -hmm. with political power. I think if you uh -huh. want a voice, you got to start to put your money and your politics together. Yes. Like all of this, like we just going to go and put our fists in the air and, and hope for the best. That is not what they respond to. No. What, what gets responded to is, is money. And now we are at a point, not everybody has it. I'm not saying that, but those of us that are, that are people that are talking have influence and have money. And we fundraise for a lot of things. We fundraise at the strip club. We fundraise a yes. lot of places. We need yes. to refocus our fundraising efforts and understand that some of that shit needs to happen politically. I, and not I wish just, I had not just to have a good time. I, I, I wish I had an audience. I would applaud you right now. <laughs>
<laughs> that's it. Like I said, that's, that's like it. I said don't get me started because I'd rather talk politics <laughs> than music, for sure. That's key. <laughs> Now, yeah. let me we got we got three minutes left. So really quick, yeah. I got two more questions for you. The first one is, give me your top five. Going back to what you do for a living, music. Give me your top five artists, man. It could be dead or alive. Oh, top artists. Five. Um, okay. I thought you were gonna say rappers, cause then that'd get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> artists. I, this was easy because you, I don't think there's a wrong answer. Stevie, it's Michael, it's Prince. Um. Man, I'm gonna have to say I'm gonna have to put Beyonce in that. Yes. To, yes. um, man, I don't know who's a who would be the fifth. Maybe Aretha, maybe Whitney. Uh huh. Uh, Whitney was amazing, but yeah, like, yes, was. like I still be listening to Stevie and Prince and like and just marveling at what they do. I was watching. I was on YouTube last night watching um just live performances of Stevie. I've never seen Stevie live, believe it or not. Okay. And I was watching him live and he's just man, he's an amazing writer and yes. musician. Like, yeah. Like I'm glad you said artists and not rappers, because people get emotional <laughs> when you start talking about they like top five rappers. They'll fight it over that shit. <laughs> you know now last question, man. What's next for you? What do you have on your plate? What's on your agenda that you want to share with the people? And, uh, um, the 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 um, there's always something going on. But one of the, my passion projects right now, I want to shout out two things. Um, my brother uh, has a passion project that he's working on called the Architects, which he you know we're in this, sort of in this moment where everybody's sort of honoring each other and uh -huh. we're honoring through verses and stuff like that. Tricky's yeah. been doing the Architects uh, playlist for two years now. Okay. Where he's just paying homage to the to the people and the artists yeah. and the and the that, that yeah. have, who put into his career. That's his thing. That's about to turn in. He just signed a big podcast deal for that. So congratulations wow. to him. Yeah, and right, I'm doing. Yeah. I'm a big sports fan. I'm doing a uh, sports and entertainment podcast called Stat Lines Matter. That line we get on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we get on it. We talk sports and that whole thing. And I'm gonna be announcing some big things about that. So those are the two things. Many other things. I got an artist named MKXYZ coming out. She's amazing. Uh, Wix Patton coming out is amazing. Saucedo's coming out is amazing. Andy Tracy's coming out. She's amazing. A girl out of Dallas, Duncanville, Texas named Nevaeh. So, like, those are, like, the artists that we're working with at the moment that we all love. And, you know, I've been calling you, man, send me some tracks. Stop playing. Got you. Got you. Stop playing. <laughs> Stop holding back. I got you. I got you. They're on the way. They're on the way. I promise. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know what? Kimmy just said Sade. Sade is, like, Real talk, Shadi would have supposed to be my wife. So yeah, I have to be top five. like with all due respect to my actual wife, I was watching Shadi videos last night. Shadi, like I was in love. Like until I met my wife, I thought me and Shadi was getting married. Ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Listen, man, I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. And um, you know, I, I got much love for you, Laney, Tricky, man, the whole crew. Uh, y'all gave me an opportunity when nobody else would, and I appreciate it, man. From from, I mean, from now until Jesus comes. I know nah, you man. guys, man. You know, Listen, man, well, I appreciate you, and thank you for having me on, letting me share your platform with me. Like I said, I don't I don't talk much, but, you know, for you, I would. I appreciate and you, And Antonio, I definitely think Versus should go back to uh, songwriters and producers, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so I'm, I, I need to get you back on here. And listen, tell Tricky, I said I need him on here, man. I, I need okay, I'll get, him, I'll get him on, man. Tricky loves to talk. He's, there, okay. he's the exact opposite of me. He loves talking about his own shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, man. Thanks. Man. All right, my Thank brother. You. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.